In this video, we're going to continue our discussion of lateral epicondylitis by discussing the three associated special tests that are specific for the condition. But before we do those, I want to mention one very important clinical feature of this condition, and that is pain with palpation. So one thing you want to do when you're assessing for this is you want to firmly palpate the area around the lateral epicondyle. Usually I'll target the lateral epicondyle and move a little bit distal to that into the forearm, just barely, because that's where the common extensor tendon is. This is important for a couple of reasons. One, it's useful in the diagnosis of the condition, but also once you know it's lateral epicondylitis and you're going to treat it, you might want to use ultrasound. That's one of the common treatments for this condition. And if you're going to use ultrasound, that's only good in a very small area. You want to make sure you're applying the ultrasound and the gel in the right area. So you want to make sure you're on the right area that is painful. So it's useful in diagnosis and then also in localization of the pain. The first special test is Maudsley's test. And to perform this test, the patient will be positioned and seated with their arm pronated and resting on the table like you see here. So palms face down. And you'll instruct the patient to extend their third digit while applying manual resistance into third digit flexion. In other words, they're gonna try and push their third digit up off the table, just the third digit, and you're gonna try and push it down into the table. So I'll apply pressure right there to the proximal phalanx of the third digit. And since I'm applying about as much pressure as needed just to prevent their finger from coming up, it's kind of like an isometric manual muscle test, so to speak. Okay? You'll also notice that when she contracts her ECRB to extend the third digit, the tendon of ECRB kind of flares out. And so if you watch for that tendon to come out of the hand like that, that's one indication that they're contracting the correct muscle and they're doing this in the correct way. Okay? A positive test is going to be reproduction of pain, specifically around the lateral epicondyle. And why would we do a test like this? Well, remember, extensor carpi radialis brevis is most likely the muscle implicated in lateral epicondylitis due to its origin on that common extensor tendon. So by having them perform resisted extension of the third digit, which is where the ECRB attaches, we're specifically putting stress on the component of the common extensor tendon that's associated with ECRB. Let's take one more look at that. So they try to extend the third digit up, we resist it by pushing down, by putting pressure specifically on the proximal phalanx of the third digit. A positive test is reproduction of pain at the lateral epicondyle. Now, other than third digit extension, recall that the actions of extensor carpi radialis brevis include wrist extension and radial deviation. Cozen's test takes advantage of that. So to perform Cozen's test, the patient will be positioned and seated, as you see right here. And initially, you're going to have the patient position their wrist in a combination of radial deviation and extension. And they're going to hold that position. So let's take a look at that. So she makes a fist. There's wrist extension and radial deviation. And I know this is radial deviation because uh, the wrist is angled in the frontal plane in the direction of the thumb. That is radial deviation. Ulnar deviation would be in the direction of the pinky, the fifth digit. Okay. Now, essentially what we're going to do is a resisted strength test. So she's going to attempt to hold her wrist in extension and radial deviation. I'm going to try to pull her out of that. In other words, I'm going to have to pull her into a combination of flexion, the opposite of extension, and ulnar deviation, the opposite of radial deviation. So she attempts to hold that position against manual resistance. And a positive test is going to be reproduction of pain at the lateral epicondyle. Now, some sources will say that while you're applying the manual resistance here, you're also supposed to firmly palpate the lateral epicondyle. However, if somebody truly has lateral epicondylitis, this resisted movement is going to be painful regardless of whether or not you're palpating at the lateral epicondyle. Okay? So just to review, have the patient extend and radially deviate at the wrist, and they're going to hold that position. And then you apply manual resistance to try and pull them out of that position and they resist. And a positive test is going to be reproduction of pain at the lateral epicondyle, just as it was for Maudsley's test. The third special test is Mills test. To perform Mills test, the patient will be positioned in either seated or standing. I'll be demonstrating this with the patient in seated. 
Now initially, you're going to stabilize the patient's humerus with their elbow in flexion, and you're going to passively flex the patient's wrist. So let's look at the starting patient position. So right there with my left arm, I'm holding the patient's humerus, stabilizing that, and I'm going to position their wrist in flexion with their elbow flexed. Okay. Now the patient can make a light fist, or they can leave their hand open like this. It doesn't matter, as long as their wrist is in some degree of flexion and you're beginning in elbow flexion. Okay. So let's take a look further. Now while maintaining that wrist flexion, you're going to passively extend the patient's elbow. Just like this. Notice as I took her to full elbow extension, I maintained that wrist flexion. And a positive test is going to be reproduction of pain at the lateral epicondyle, just as it was with both Maudsley's test and Cozen's test. Let's take one more look at Mill's test. So again, we're going to stabilize the patient's humerus with their elbow in flexion and passively flex the patient's wrist. We need to maintain that wrist flexion the entire time. Once we have a good grip into wrist flexion, we're going to then passively extend the patient's elbow. And again, a positive test is reproduction of pain at the lateral epicondyle. Now, depending on which source you're looking at, um, some will actually say that when you do the passive extension of the elbow, that you need to also move the shoulder into extension. So basically that's where the humerus would be positioned uh, behind the back. Okay? Um, that is not necessary when you're wanting to be specific for lateral epicondylitis. If while I maintain the wrist flexion and extend the elbow, I also perform shoulder extension where the humerus sort of goes behind the body, right behind the body's frontal plane, uh, that also is going to tense the radial nerve. In fact, that's very similar to the position of the radial nerve tension test. But in that case, if I get reproduction of pain near the lateral epicondyle, uh, is that a radial nerve issue or is that true lateral epicondylitis? Or maybe it's both. I don't really know. So by keeping the shoulder in front of the body here, more in a flexed position, I can be much more confident that if I get the reproduction of pain here at the lateral epicondyle, that it's true lateral epicondylitis. Because in this position of shoulder flexion, I'm not really tensing the radial nerve very much. Whereas if I put the humerus behind the body into shoulder extension, now I'm also tensing the radial nerve. Again, I want to be sure it's lateral epicondylitis and not strictly a radial nerve issue. If I wanted to further rule up a radial nerve issue, I could always do the radial nerve tension test, and I could do it maybe without the wrist flexion and maybe just involve some other joints. There's various ways you can do that. But by having the shoulder flexed, you can be more sure that it is lateral epicondylitis. Thank you for all your support. Be sure to check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.